Hello, what a show we have for you this week with numerous upsets over the weekend. This includes defeats for four sides in playoff positions and in particular a shocker for Salford who had David Beckham watching on. We start with the league leaders. It was on Tuesday Solihull Moors went top for the first time in their history, winning 3-0 at Aldershot. Barnet visited without a win in three. Just four minutes in, Darren Curry's strugglers attacked in the Midlands. Wes Fonga got himself into a strong position in the Moors box, ending a move by giving the visitors an early lead, 1-0. Then approaching the hour mark, Shaq Kultus was played into a dangerous position and exquisitely chipped Ryan Boot, making it nine in nine in all competitions. But right after going two up, the Bees' hopes of causing an upset were hit as Ashley Charles earned a second yellow card in four minutes, meaning his team were down to ten men. Tim Flowers' side were quick to capitalise, applying pressure to Barnett. After pinball in the box, Nathan Blissett struck for the seventh time in ten since signing from Macclesfield Town. And Moores again utilised the right in the 94th minute, as this time Kyle Storer beat Will Huffer, securing a vital point in Solihull's promotion quest. That draw for Solihull presented Leighton Orient the opportunity to move to the top of the table with a win over a Maidenhead side very much in the relegation mix. In fact, the visitors had the joint worst defence in the league at the start of the weekend's play, so it was no surprise that it was Orient's Sam Ling who had the best chance of the first half. Yet shortly after the break, it was Maidenhead who took advantage. Adrian Clifton was just about onside and thus able to put away his 11th of the season. Orient huffed and puffed with Craig Clay trying his best to set up an equaliser late on, only for Matt Harold to sky his effort. It wasn't to be the East Londoners' day, and they were lucky not to fall two down right at the end. Mike Fondup chipping only onto the post. It didn't prove costly in the end, though, a vital win for the Magpies, which moved them out of the relegation zone. Unbeaten in four, Haven't and Waterlooville hosted Wrexham, whose away form didn't befit a team going for promotion. The Dragons hadn't scored on the road since mid-November. After a quarter of an hour, Wes Fogden went down inside the visitors' box, and despite Wrexham protests, Richard Hume awarded a penalty to Haven't. Joe Quigley stepped up, beating Rob Lainton and scoring his first goal for the Hawks. On the other side of the interval, Brian Hughes's men meant business. Moving quickly, Akil Wright played in Ben Tollett, who was denied by Ben Dudzinski. Next came a delivery into a crowded box, and Captain Sean Pearson rose to head in his fourth goal of the campaign. 20 years ago, Hughes and the haven't boss Lee Bradbury were teammates together at Birmingham City. Hughes was then to see his side take control against his old friend at Westley Park as Wright finished off a team move, making it 2-1. Moments later in Hampshire, Tollett provided for the intelligent James Jennings and he completed a devastating period of three goals in 12 minutes. Alfie Rutherford had been causing the away team problems in the second half and managed to reduce the deficit, scoring for the first time in nine appearances. But Wrexham's first away victory in four months lifts them to second, only two points off leaders Solihull. Fans of Salford City were joined by footballing royalty on Saturday. David Beckham pitched up at the Peninsula Stadium for the first time since buying a 10% stake in the club. And Bex took the opportunity to meet players and supporters before the game against struggling Dover Athletic. But before a ball was kicked, tributes were paid to Eric Harrison, who earlier in the week died at the age of 81. Harrison played for the likes of Halifax Town, Hartlepool and Barrow, but more famously remembered as mentor to a number of young footballers at Manchester United.
The club have hit something of a blip of late, with their last win at home in the league coming on New Year's Day. But as if he knew a certain man was watching, Dennis Politic scored a goal straight out of the David Beckham nostalgia vault to prolong Salford's record of scoring in every home game this season. The hosts went close to doubling their advantage. Carpier Gianni not able to convert during a goal mouth scramble. And that would be as good as it got for the Amis. Dover came into the contest unbeaten on their travels in 2019 and played with that confidence. After Chris Neal kept out the strike from any F. Young, Dan McNamara was on hand to put away the equaliser. And just before the hour mark, Bobby Joe Taylor crossed for Scott Doe to put the visitors ahead. Jai Reason scored a lovely strike in the defeat to Harrogate last time out. This time he was at it again to seal a big win. A dampener for Beckham's big day out and another shock to add to a day of topsy-turvy results. I think the time for talking is finished. I don't, you know, I don't want to hear what we're we're going to do what, what we might do what we have done it's about actions now so um, all we're looking for next week and all this week from Monday onwards is actions I don't, I don't want to hear any um, conversations about what we could possibly do it's about putting it into action Tuesday we learned of some sad news as Gordon Banks died aged 81 one of the game's greatest of all time and a hero to so many the goalkeeper from Sheffield played in every game when England won the World Cup in 1966 a fine career that also included long stints with Leicester City and Stoke City started with Chesterfield appreciation was shown prior to their clash away at AFC Fylde Last weekend, the hosts, Danny Philliskirk, scored an own goal and missed an opportunity to make up for it early on in the northwest. Still inside the opening quarter of an hour, but up at the other end, Marc Antoine Fortune treated the visiting Spyrites fans to a terrific solo effort, his seventh goal of the season. Dave Challoner's team were unbeaten in three in the league and came close to levelling on half an hour, but Nick Horton was denied by the post. And a minute from time, the woodwork stopped filed again. Dan Bradley would have scored some goal at Mill Farm. Having already moved out of the drop zone for the first time this season, Chesterfield are now unbeaten in seven. You get the goal and it gives you that chance of winning. You know, we didn't have to score two, we just needed to keep a clean sheet, which they've done They've done brilliant since they come in. So um, it's full credit to the players, more than anyone else, to uh, for where we are now. They've responded to a new manager coming in. Um, it's I think that's 10 points from 12 now. So we've just got to carry on that form. We know the importance of trying to stay in the division. Prior to welcoming mid-table Barrow, Sutton had proved tough to beat at home. Paul Doswell's side had won their previous four on their own ground, yet it was the visitors who should have broken the deadlock. Josh Kay missing a glorious opportunity. In the second period, Sutton created a chance from a similar position. This time it was the turn of Brett Williams to miss the target. Barrow had narrowly avoided relegation last season, but look a lot more comfortable this time round, though they find themselves stranded between the relegation and promotion places. Lewis Hardcastle unlucky not to give them the lead. And they were lucky, however, to avoid conceding with a quarter of an hour to go when James Collins headed wide. Sutton hadn't lost at home in the league since November, but on a day where form seemed to go out of the window, Barrow and Kay snatched victory via a heavy deflection his first senior goal and a blow to Sutton's automatic promotion hopes. I thought we shaded it to be honest, I thought we were the better team, I thought we could have maybe scored two or three, had the better chances. But it's a difficult place to come, certainly a very good team, very well managed, very well coached. Um, and it's difficult to play against set pieces, the, the some of the direct play. Um, but we stood up to that really well and then we, we were quick and pacey on the counter attack which we planned and again we're lucky we earned that bit of luck at the end because of the, the way we played our football. Hosting Ebbsfleet United, Harrogate Town had won their previous two and were still very much part of the playoff picture in the National League. After only eight minutes, an Andy Drury corner found Michael Cheek, who found the back of the net scoring for Fleet for the first time since August. 
Next, Jack Payne went for goal. Followed by Sam Magri having a go from a corner. Also Corey Whiteley and Jack King, all of whom failed. Still in the first period at Weatherby Road, the hosts attempted to equalise with Jack Emmett testing Nathan Ashmore. Ashmore was called on again shortly after, following a shot on goal from distance by George Thompson. On the other side of the break, Simon Weaver's side finally earned the equaliser they'd been pushing for as Jack Muldoon netted goal number 12 of the season, one all, game on. Despite momentum being with the home team, the clash ended up being won at the other end. A well-worked Ebbsfleet move was finished off by Drury, who turned goal scorer. Fleet may be mid-table, but they're now only five points away from the playoffs. It's a frustrating uh, game for us because we, we didn't come out the blocks as we, we normally do, especially at home. Um, didn't pass the ball a, as well as we, we possibly can. And, uh, and they got on the front foot and... Uh, they're a strong team, you know, they, he's turned it around well as, as the manager and, and they've got big powerful boys and made it awkward for us, made life difficult uh, and we weren't fluent by any stretch. Dagenham are stuck in a rut, sitting mid-table with just one win in six and a failure to keep a clean sheet in 11. So they wouldn't have been grateful for the visit of a Gateshead side enjoying their best run of the season. As Dagger's unlucky not to open the scoring, though, not only when Kenny Clark headed against the bar, but also when Lamar Reynolds saw his first attempt saved and his second cleared off the line. Instead, it was the form side who took the lead before the break. Mike Williamson fouled in the penalty area, allowing Stephen Rigg to step up and convert his sixth of the season, incidentally his first goal since mid-October. Rigg had also found the net in a 2-0 win in the reverse fixture and the Heed matched that scoreline again, with that man Rigg tucking away his second of the game after the interval. To cap another disappointing afternoon for the Daggers, they spurn the chance of a lifeline after referee Carl Brook awarded a penalty. Ainsley pairs saving Connor Wilkinson's spot kick as Peter Taylor's side still can't ease themselves away from danger. The, um, the decision for the penalty, which was, I thought, harsh, but the referee gave it, so we, we, we've got to live with it. Uh, we, we actually got a penalty ourselves and missed it, so um, it was just one of those things, but just disappointing. Having defeated Salford last weekend, Braintree Town went to Eastleigh, who hadn't lost at the Silver Lake Stadium in seven matches. A quarter of an hour in, Paul McCallum connected with a Mark Yates corner, giving the hosts an early lead, 1-0. Only three minutes later, McCallum and Yates were at it again in the south. Another Yates assist, another McCallum goal. He's on 19 for the campaign, four in his last two. Braintree had a lot to do to get what would only be a second victory on the road in eight. But this was helped by Corey Henry going down inside the Spitfires box, penalty given. Callum Morton was brilliantly denied, however, by Luke Southwood. Pressure on Eastleigh was building, and just before the interval, a Ricky Gabriel pass was volleyed in by Cameron James, 2-1, and for Colchester United Loney James, a second of the season. Into the second half, one of the hosts' subs, Kevin and Miley, was sent off for two bookable offences, but it didn't stop Ben Strevens' men making it four home wins in succession. Cav made a mistake in getting sent off, but the boys have dug him out of the hole. I've always said that, we're going to make mistakes, you're going to do things, it's not always going to go away, but um, to work as hard as they did for each other and to battle and... You know, we had to clear things off the line, the keepers come out and made saves and stuff like that, you know. Over a course of a season, any good side, you know, you win games when you play really well, but you also have to win games where you're not probably at your best or when things go against you. And I think, you know, hopefully there's signs of a good team there, you know, that we've done that today. The, the mentality in the dressing room is, for us, yes, eight wins will probably do it, but we have to try and win every full match. And there's no point trying to nick points here and there, we have to win. Boreham Wood are certainly a side on the slide. They hadn't picked up a win in six matches ahead of the visit of Hartlepool, who started the day just a point above the wood, but a side that have found goal scoring pretty simple of late. 
it took Craig Hignett's men less than seven minutes to ensure a 14th game in a row in which they found the net. Nicky Kabamba scoring for the fourth consecutive match. Jamal Feifel did head against the crossbar before the break, but shortly after it, his team were two down. Josh Hawks with a finish, which seemed all too easy. And when the bar was troubled once again, this time by Kieran Murta, it didn't look like it was going to be the home side's day. And before the hour was up, Hartlepool were three up. Luke James brought down to give Hawks the opportunity to make the game safe. And the 20-year-old did just that. Hartlepool had won just three of their previous 17, but Boreham Wood proved the perfect opponents to improve that run. Kabamba adding his second and number four of the afternoon to secure the club's biggest away win since 2004. I thought they were terrific. I thought first half we didn't pass the ball as well as we can do, but the shape um, and everything we asked of them was there. We just needed to be a bit more controlled second half and pass it, and we did. I give them probably an upbeat conversation at half time, and I'm, I'm assessing now do I get into them a little bit more because maybe they're thinking that all we've got to do is do what we did in the second half, and unfortunately, that's not football. Bromley were unbeaten in all five matches against Maidstone United in the fifth tier. Against anyone else at the moment, meanwhile, John Stills Stones hadn't won in four. Half an hour in at Hayes Lane, Neil Smith's team attacked the visitors' left and a Richard Brindley delivery found its way to JJ Hooper, who beat Dion Henry to open the scoring 1-0. After the break in the capital, Maidstone sought the equaliser, but from close range, Justin Amalazor will surely feel he should have done better, denied by the Ravens' David Gregory. At the other end, it was Henry's turn again, facing a shot from Luke Coulson after he'd teed himself up with an excellent bit of skill on the edge of the area. Into the 95th minute of the clash, the hosts Mark Anthony Okoye opted for the long ball route, allowing Grimsby Loney Hooper in to wrap up victory with a seventh goal in ten. Bromley have still never lost to Maidstone. Today, even from the centre, from the first minute, we, we looked dominant and we looked like we wanted to get on the ball, quite play quick football and just play to our strengths. And, uh, you know, we have a massive crowd here as, as well. You know, hopefully they go home and uh, we're really proud of what the boys put in for them. Two sides struggling for a win met at the Shea Stadium. FC Halifax Town hadn't scored in four, while Aldershot hadn't won in 17 matches in all competitions. So it didn't bode well for a thriller, and so it proved. Scott quickly forcing a decent save for the first real chance of the match. Aldershot had picked up their biggest win of the season when they welcomed the Shea men in October, but that 3-0 victory never looked like being repeated. Rhys Grant could have done better on this occasion. Good work from Matty Koslo eventually called goalkeeper Jake Cole into action, but overall, the chances for both sides were few and far between. Jerry McDonough came off the bench to drag an effort wide, as eventually the game ended goalless. Aldershot's record-breaking winless run continues, though FC Halifax Town will feel just as shaky about their own survival hopes. So the big weekend winners are Wrexham. Defeats for five of the top seven ensures the Dragons go up to second, two points behind leaders Solihull with a game in hand. Salford's title challenge took a massive blow as they lost to relegation threatened Dover. And with 10 points from their last 10 games, Graham Alexander must fear that form at the moment may even threaten a playoff finish. Gateshead break into the top seven after going five games unbeaten and Eastleigh with their fourth win on the bounce a level on points with Sutton. After beating Salford, Dover are now two points clear of the bottom four. Chesterfield, meanwhile, a much better place to avoid a second relegation on the bounce, unbeaten with three wins from their previous four. But Aldershot's wait for a win continues. Five points for them from 42 available doesn't make for good reading, with Gary Waddock desperate to sort this out ASAP. <laughs> Altrincham joined the fight to battle homophobia by wearing a specially made rainbow-coloured kit based on the LGBT flag. 
The National League North side, who normally play in red and white, became the first football club to wear a shirt inspired by the flag, also changing the sponsorship logo to Football v Homophobia. As for footballing matters on the pitch, the Greater Manchester side welcomed Bradford Park Avenue, a match-up between two playoff hopefuls. The rainbow shirts made their mark midway through the first half, Josh Hancock beating the goalkeeper to the ball and just about giving his side the lead. After the game, Altrincham would auction off their special shirts to raise money for the Proud Trust, although they ultimately had to share the proceeds as far as the points were concerned, as Danny East, who missed the first half of the campaign through injury, came off the bench to add the crucial touch and earn Bradford Park Avenue a point. Chorley still lead the way at the top of the National League North table, despite a surprise 2-1 defeat at Alfreton. That allowed Stockport to close the gap to three points after their 3-2 win against Telford. But take a look at Spennymore. Five straight victories with two games in hand. Win those and they could be a point behind the leaders. They may be top of the south, yet Torquay United also suffered a defeat. 2-0 to Welling. That's their second loss in four games, with Woking just a point behind now and with a game in hand. Chelmsford still in the mix as they won their fourth straight game and Billericay are hoping to cement their place in the top seven. Four back-to-back -back wins for Harry Wheeler's side and unbeaten in five. On the way on BT Sport, four live Premier League clashes in a week, including two massive London derbies. This coming Saturday, Leicester City host Crystal Palace, who won away at the King Power Stadium last season. We're live from the East Midlands at 5pm. Newcastle host Burnley midweek, with both clubs having this weekend off due to being out of the FA Cup. Coverage starts a week on Tuesday at 7.30. The day after, it's Chelsea at home to Tottenham Hotspur. Both are obviously desperate to at least secure Champions League football for next season. Jake and the team are with you from 7.15 at the bridge. And we have Spurs again on the first Saturday in March, hosting Arsenal in the North London derby. This is an early kickoff on TV, on your phone and tablet from 11.45 in the morning. All matches are not only live on BT Sport 1, but also on our 4K UHD channel. All of us on the National League team will have another show for you in a few days' time. Make sure you're watching to see how Solihull are getting on in their bid to make the EFL. Goodbye for now.